There was a there was a study that was conducted by researchers at New York's Stony Brook University and the Chinese Southwest University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. They had discovered the psychological condition of introversion is actually a trait with genetic roots that approximately 20% of the people have and that is found in animals as well, even in fruit flies. So apparently it has a very long history and an evolutionary advantage for communities, animals, and people live in. People that have this genetic trait are often somewhat more withdrawn, contemplative, and philosophical, and often are interested in spirituality. They think first and act only after they have properly thought about what they want, if they ever act at all. And they often become artists, musicians, writers, politicians, philosophers, healers, and priests. And they hit that subscribe button as well. So that's the first important lesson here, folks. Interest in spirituality and talent for spirituality, possibly for a part, is genetically determined and it often runs in families. We see that in animism and shamanism, for example, we see that. There are certain families that bring forth great shamans. And we see it, for instance, in Judaism, where rabbis come from certain lineages of families. I come from a long line of frontiersmen and outdoor types. And in fact, my mother was a drummer for a circus band. And that is, that is the gospel truth. And I'll, I'll just leave my history there. But I, I come from a very unique line of people, peoples. Suffice to say, it, we're a group of people who never really fit in. Gypsies, you know, carnival folk. So there is this trait that runs throughout people. And if you're a little odd, if you're a little out of the norm, it's okay. Embrace your difference. Embrace your variety. For variety uh, is beholden to source. Source does not like sameness. Source encourages exploration and whatnot. So little future shamans out there when you're a child and you're embracing your differences that's the only thing that's different from other children is they are sometimes somewhat more withdrawn the little quiet ones you know um, allow them to germinate allow them to uh, undergo their journeys their heroes journeys they often like to be alone and they are mostly very capable of entertaining themselves but after they have become adults, at one point in their lives, they often get frustrated. They no longer seem to fit in our normal material world. They have nightmares, visions, and become aware that they are no longer happy with who they are. A report of what is actually a typical shamanic awakening, vision, or dream goes something like this. In this vision, I was brought to the underworld. There I was killed in the most gruesome way. My body was torn apart and the body parts were put in a large cooking pot. Then I was cooked for several days until all the flesh up to the last fiber was cooked off my bone. It was really a very painful, horrible experience. Then this cooked fluid was thrown away and my bones were thrown all over the place. Then I literally recollected, rec recollected myself, my bones rather, and with a huge effort and with the help of the spirits, gods, put them back together. Then I crawled back to the upper world, but I realized that the only way I could proceed with my life was on the spiritual path. I was a totally new person now. I was reborn, etc., etc. So the underlying theme here is that the old person that was preoccupied with the material world dies. The old person who was preoccupied with the digital matrix, the third dimension, goes away. It's testified without a, without a doubt that my 
rebirth began August 11th of 2021 and culminated September 24th, roughly, of 2021 with my full Kundalini awakening. And here, here we are, folks, on this spiritual path. Um, but when you die to the old you, like when Paul of Tarsus or Saul becomes Paul on the road to Damascus, um, you're no longer pre preoccupied with the third dimension, the digital matrix. You're reborn and your path forward is a spiritual path and a path that takes you to the new earth, the Heros Gamos, bringing heaven into earth and, and allowing it to um, flourish through your every word, through your thoughts, through your actions, your intention. So, but this same theme we see in a fundamental myth of the first urban cultures in the world. The Sumerian, and inspired by that, the Assyrian, Akkadian, and Babylonian flood stories. Shortly after the creation, and after a war breaks out between the higher and lower gods, about all the work the lower gods have to do, a compromise is found. Essentially, that's the story of the Anunnaki and the Igigi and all that. So, but they are going to create humans to do the work. And a task is given to, to God of the winds, heaven, Enlil, and so it is done. He creates servants to bring food to the God. That's exactly what we see people do all over the world, bring food to the temple. And first, everything seems to go well, but because humans were made out of a clay that was created out of one of the gods, humans also were given the potential to be like gods, and thus also have a conscious mind. That seemed to be a noble-minded thing at first, but unfortunately, after some time, these humans not only become aware of themselves, but also of the situation they are in. They are servants, slaves to the gods. And they and their hubris don't accept that and cause an uproar. The cabal. Then the gods decide that the creation of these worthless servants, humans, was a mistake. And Enlil proposes to wipe these no-good servants off the face of the earth with the help of a flood, a seven-day deluge. But his younger brother and god of the underground waters, earth, void, and magic, Inki, is hurt and disappointed all humans have to die. So he looks for the most wise and God-fearing human and finds him, Zyasudra. Inki tells him in a dream about Enlil's plans to kill all humans and tells him to abandon his worldly activities and possessions and build an ark, the preserver of life. In this ark, he should take not only his family, but the seeds of all living beings. The ark is supposed to keep the sunlight out, like a coffin, has seven floors and is built in seven days. Then the flood comes that washes humanity off the earth. But Ziasudra and his family survive in the ark and land on the peak of a mountain where they stay for seven days. Then they send out birds to check if the water has subsided. And there is land to live on, which is in the end is found. Now when the older brother Enlil and the other gods finally find out about Ziasudra and see his respect and devotion to the gods and the larger cosmic order, they are forgiving and gracefully let him live. And to Zyasudra is confirmed again, humans have the potential to be like God. In this initiation myth, we see the same elements as in the shamanic awakening story. The old human or humanity that is preoccupied with the material world, the water that is at the same time a cleansing medium and a death of the old human or humanity, a container, here a coffin-like ark, a kind of rebirth, and a new human or humanity that in the end understands it has to submit to the larger spiritual and cosmic order of the gods. So they can become immortal and have the potential to become like gods as well. This flood myth we can now with great certainty conclude is a remnant of the older shamanistic awakening vision. The Jews during the Babylonian exile adopted this myth which in the Torah became the famous story of Noah and the flood. So the roots of that story are in the shamanic awakening as well. A similar story is that of the Egyptian king god Osiris, who is the victim of his brother Seth's envy. Seth, at a certain moment, cunningly locks Osiris up in a coffin, sarcophagus, 
and throws him in the Nile where Osiris died. With the help of his sister and wife, Isis, Osiris' body is recovered, but Seth then chops the body into pieces and scatters the pieces all over Egypt. Isis again manages to recover all the body parts, puts them together, and copulates with it after she tied a golden phallus to the body of Osiris. In the end, Osiris is kind of reborn as his son, the god Horus, who after being hidden in a basket on the Nile to escape Seth, in the end rules Egypt. He is the prototype pharaoh. Osiris himself becomes the god of the afterlife. In ancient Greece, a similar initiation myth is the story of the birth of Dionysus. Dionysus was the unborn child of an unfair Zeus disguised as a mortal earthly man had with Semele. The jealous official wife of Zeus, Hera, leads Semele to Zeus in his godly capacity, but the earthling that she is can't bear the rays of the god Zeus and she dies. Zeus rescues the child from Semele's womb and places him in his thigh. This way Dionysus, the twice born, later indeed is born a second time. An older version of the story says that the bodily remains of Dionysus, mother Semele, with the unborn Dionysus were put in a coffin and entrusted to the seas after which they stranded in Laconia. Then Dionysus was taken out of the womb alive and brought up there. In the Bible, we have the story or myth rather of Moses who was put in an ark on the life-giving Nile River after all Jewish boys are threatened to be murdered. He is kind of reborn as well. First he is a Jewish baby and later with the ark in the Nile River as a kind of mediator or portal is handed to the Pharaoh's daughter who names him Moses, which according to the writer of this biblical story means, I drew him from the water. He reemerges in the world of the Egyptian pharaonic court where he is immersed in the culture and knowledge of the Egyptian. Then he is confronted with the slavery of his people, death, murder, even as a consequence, a threatening death penalty. Leads out of Egypt stripped of all his material goods and becomes a shepherd. Later, with the help of originally God of the storms, Yahweh, I am who I am, I am he who shall be here, or I am he who lets become, he becomes a magician. Moses becomes a magician with the help of the God of the storms, Yahweh, or Enlil. Then shepherd, leader Moses, with the help of his advocate Aaron, and a lot of magic leads his people out of slavery, leads them with the power of his staff through a large body of water and a desert where in a period of 40 years, a new God-fearing, sacred, and chosen generation of people emerges. And finally, he leads them to a sacred and holy land. No, there never was an actual historic Moses, as is the scientific view today. It's a myth. This is, a, this is originally probably an initiation story as well. Read out, read out loud generation after generation in the sacred mystical space of long-lost temples, synagogues, and churches. In the New Testament, this initiation story has evolved into the baptism with water. The container now is the River Jordan itself. And later in the story, the fishing boats of the apostle. They become fishermen of people. Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River is clearly evolved from the, evolved from the older initiation stories as well. In Jesus' words, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the act of rebirth in the gospel later is reinforced by the words of the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. With these words, we erase our earthly material and personal history, our old identity that for a large part is shaped by misdeeds, digital matrix and hurts done to us by others and guilt of our own misconducts towards others and we put our life as reborn individuals into the hands of God. So these words in the Lord's Prayer actually represent a very deep psychological and mystical transformation or transitional process and clearly stand in the tradition of older initiation myths. The Lord's Prayer, by the way, is divided in two parts. The first part is about heaven and the second about earth. 
in an older Jewish Aramaic version of the Lord's Prayer, the sentence, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is, may your will be done just as, is, just as it is in heaven, so, so also upon the earth. May your will be done just as it is in heaven, so also upon the earth. So also upon the earth. This is the transition from the heavenly realm into the earthly realm. The line, give us this day our daily bread, and that Jewish Aramaic Lord's Prayer is our bread, which is from the earth, give us day by day. And the line, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil is, and do not bring us to trial or judgment after we have died, rather deliver us from evil. With these last beautiful words, we again put our lives into the hands of God. It is important to establish that a growing number of modern scholars think that the Gospels also were written in the context of Jewish mystery schools. Another kind of stories that are in the line of these initiation stories are the stories of Moses and Jesus, who respectively find themselves 40 years, 40 days in the desert. The desert is the symbolic state where one is cleansing oneself by 40 days of fasting. This causes a confrontation with our earthly material instincts, Satan. But in the end, when we have put aside the temptations of the material world, brings us heavenly food, mana. Ascending the Sinai mountain by Moses after the fasting is completed is getting in contact with the heavenly realm, i.e. looking Yahweh or God in the face, as Christian esoteric groups still call this. The element in the New Testament where Jesus gets 40 whiplashes when he is delivered to Pilate indirectly refers to the 40 years days of fasting as well. This is also a kind of cleansing through scourging or auto mutilation like cutting or branding the skin. The idea behind fasting and scourging is that we distance ourselves from our material body and put it under extreme stress so deep hidden spiritual or paranormal capabilities come to the surface but the most fundamental story in the new testament of course is the whole crucifixion and resurrection story of jesus himself which fits in our theme of rebirth as well perfectly i might add jesus dies on the cross and is re resurrected three days later and there were many other in initiation stories that fitted with different rites of passage students of the mysteries had to undergo it seems, by the way, that Jesus is a modern version of Moses, but with a new set of morals. His morals are similar to the morals of Socrates, who said that it is worse for the soul to do evil to other people than to have evil done to us. This is the root of the rather fundamental, fundamentalistic Christian idea that we sometimes have to more or less sacrifice ourselves in favor of the other. Compare the very ancient Greek concept of Philotimo. And when Jesus is the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, shortly before he is arrested, he specifically refers to the death of Socrates, Socrates, who was forced to take his own life by a poisonous drink, by saying, take this cup away from me. The morality of the Gospels, thus, is nothing more than Jewish morality and life philosophy based on their kind of old school tribal religion meets the more modern cosmopolitan Greek and Roman morality and life philosophy. Apparently it was time for a new development in the religion of the Jews. The people who wrote the New Testament Gospels, anyone could write Greek for that matter, were all very familiar with Greek stories and Greek philosophy, so it is very logical that the Gospels for a part were inspired by Greek and Roman thinking as well. Now, peoples from the times of the builders of the constructions at Gobek, Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe, which means Potbelly Hill in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, in T Anatolia, on have always constructed earthbound temples, synagogues, and churches that relate or point to the sky to initiate people and receive the creative powers of the heaven. And it goes back further even goes back further in history. The earliest temples in the days of the shamans were holy places in nature itself. Specific open places in the woods, ponds, streams, rocks, caves painted with game and mystical beings where rituals like circumnambulations and tribal dances or more enclosed shamanic space travels 
or travels into the underworld took place. Recently, it was discovered that already Neanderthals sometimes buried their dead in caves with grave gifts, possibly considered to be an entrance to the underworld. Maybe they had their own rituals that accompanied the dead in their final journey as well. So these ideas possibly go back a very long way. And talking about Gobekli Tepe, Gobekli Tepe, Tepe, that is Gobekli Tepe, maybe the temples are Potbelly Hill, Maybe the temples of Potbelly Hill are the actual prototype of what later became the Sumerian and Biblical art. Round like many of the ancient but very stable boats on the Euphrates and Tigris, located at the top of an Anatolian hill, filled with animals, astronomical signs, carved on wide pillars that divided the room into smaller spaces, or stables where people underwent rebirth rituals through the seven heavens and reinforce their unity with the macrocosm by imitating the tracks of the celestial bodies in circumnambulations and dances, meditating at the stars and astronomical signs in the oldest proto-urban culture. These stories of rebirth in the end have an equivalent and are interwoven in the myths of the death and rebirth of nature. So in that sense, as well as the dynamics of the microcosm is more or less a mirror image and part of the dynamics of macrocosm. So this is all we need to know about initiations, which are reenacted in esoteric groups all over the world. They all go back to the shamanic awakening and the original shamanic awakening is possibly for a part, a genetic thing. Approximately 20% of the people have the right genes to be naturally attracted to contemplate our world and transcend our reality. And apparently societies need that. It, is apparently, it apparently has an evolutionary advantage to have spiritually charged mediums in our social core group who can plug into the other world. Now, it is my contention that if you feel drawn to be this spiritually charged medium in your social core group who can plug into the other world, I ask that you plug in with me, hit that subscribe button, let's all plug in together and uh, make our ascension to the new earth and the Hiros Gamos of bringing heaven down here to earth. It will be a glorious day indeed. Namaste, Namaskaram. But anyway, that was readings from uh, that was readings from <clears throat> the magic of Moses and Jesus, fundamentals of spirituality and, and magic. And that was uh, written by Mr. Geigengak. He's a fellow that lives in the Netherlands. Um, I'm gonna leave the title to the document. And that's, there's more to go, folks. There's a lot more to go. Uh, that's only, we're only kind of just at the beginning. We covered initiations and such. So uh, like I said, hit that subscribe button. Uh, let's all, uh, you know, kind of get, get hip on this new uh, spiritual technology together and uh, it, it'll be it'll be a glorious new earth that we'll all be able to uh, engage with with namaste namaskaram <laughs>